Centennial Church, how are we doing this morning? And it's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? And if you're watching online, thank you for, for joining us as well. If you're not already standing, would you please stand as we get ready to worship our Lord. Our focus for today is all about Jesus' deity. That means that as Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. Jesus Christ himself claimed that he was God. He taught his disciples to pray in his name. He claimed that he and the Father were one and that he was the Son of God. He also claimed that to know him was to know God, to see him was to see God, to receive him was to receive God, to believe in him was to believe in God, and to honor him was to honor God, while to hate him was also to hate God. So we don't worship Jesus today because he's a way to God. We worship because he's the only way to our God, the only way to forgiveness, and the only way to, be, to being fully realized people of God. Amen? Jesus is God, and we offer our worship to him. Amen? Amen. Now, if you would, please join us for our call to worship. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he, and he said, said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The same God that met Moses is the same God that meets us today. So let's worship him together. Come on, let's praise the Lord with our hands and with our voices this morning. For the Lord is good and greatly to be praised.
unshakable hallelujah you have done great things hallelujah God above it all hallelujah God unshakable
every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but we give glory to your name for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Yet because of the sin in our hearts, we have strayed far from you. We have disobeyed your commandments. We have trusted our own judgment and we wonder why we feel distant from you. We have worshiped idols of silver and gold, really idols of self and comfort. These have no power, these have no soul, no life. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. So forgive us, gracious God, for not loving you as we ought, for not obeying you as we were taught, and for not trusting that our forgiveness has been bought. God, help us and forgive us. Church, would you take some time to confess your sins soundly to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because you offer forgiveness your name truly is power, it is healing, and brings everlasting life. The Bible says that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind who gave himself as a ransom for all people. His name is Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. We believe. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Would you give the Lord a hand, amen? You are Lord, Jesus. You are Lord.
your name. We exalt your name. There is no higher name than your name, Jesus, and we worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this time where we can worship you together as a family, your children coming together to worship you. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word today, to hear it, and then to obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you may be seated. Good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to the nine o'clock service. If I haven't met you, my name's Clark. I'm one of the pastors here. Today we're kicking off our fall series on who is Jesus. This is a question that's been asked for really thousands of years as people debate and wrestle with his teachings and who he is. And that Jesus, we're going to look to the scriptures in just a moment, he gives us very clear answers himself. But before we get there, I want to explain something. One way God is different from humanity if you look at the screen, you're going to see some really cute pictures of little Clark Corver. Look at the screen right here, and you go through it from life, you will see from birth to preschool. You can just click through them real quick. What you're going to see is development and growth and graduations and promotions and change. And, and eventually, Lord willing, I will be a really old, blessed man. When it comes to God, God is the exact opposite. There's a theological word that's called immutable, meaning God does not change. God does not grow. God does not develop. God does not promote. God has always been the same. He is the same today, and he will always be the same going forward in the future. And so today, when we look at this, this question, who is Jesus? We're going to look at three specific passages, one from Exodus, one from John 8, and one from John 18, where you see these absolute claims of Jesus have rung forth from before time had begun. But when it comes to this unchanging God revealing himself to us, the only way that you and I get to know who God is is based upon to the extent God's revealed himself to us. Like there wasn't just one time that I discovered something about God that God did not want himself to be known. It's God revealing himself to us. So when you go to the beginning of the Bible, whether it's Adam or it's Noah or it's Abraham, it's God making himself known. It's God limiting himself so that humans who are finite might be able to wrap their head and their hearts around a little bit of who this infinite God is. So when God's talking to Father Abraham, he gives him this word that says, one day you're going to be a great people. You're going to have a land 
And he gives them a warning, saying that in there, though, you're going to be enslaved for 400 years, and I'm going to bless you. And you're going to have more descendants than the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And then after Abraham, God reveals himself to Isaac. And after Abraham and Isaac, God reveals himself to Jacob. And this is really interesting because there's a little story here when God's relationship with Jacob that will help us make sense of where we're going today. Jacob was a little weasel. He is a deceiver. He's always backstabbing, lying, being really sneaky. Like he would not have been a reliable friend, okay? This is not who Jacob is. One day, after backstabbing his brother and stealing the birthright, he had conviction to come back and try to make things right with his family. Well, on his way back, God reveals himself to Jacob as he's traveling. As they're having this conversation, God asks Jacob a really interesting question. He says, what is your name? That seems like an odd question because God is God. God knows everything. God knows what Jacob's name is. But what he's getting at is, Jacob, you've been a deceiver, you've been a little weasel, and after this encounter, you are going to live differently. And because you're going to live differently, I'm going to give you a different name. Because your name reveals your reputation. Your name points to your character. Your name points to how you live your life. And it's at that point, he changes his name from Jacob to Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. And so from that point on then, You have God revealing himself to then Joseph, God revealing himself to Moses. And what happens with Moses is Moses was a Hebrew baby that was born in a time period when Pharaoh had put out an edict that all the the Hebrew boys are to be killed. So his mom put him in a basket and sent him down the Nile River, only to be discovered by one of Pharaoh's daughters. So then Moses grows up in the palace of Egypt as royalty. But at some point in time, he he starts to put things together that he is not a descendant of Pharaoh. He is a Hebrew boy. And when he sees an Egyptian guard killing and beating on these uh, Hebrew slaves, he kills, he murders the Egyptian. And with that, he has to run. So this is where we're going to pick up the story, okay? Moses is a while he just murdered somebody. He's on the run, and God's going to come reveal himself to Moses. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? From Exodus 3, verses 1 through 15. Now, after running away, getting married, living under his father-in-law Jethro, is where we pick up. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why this bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, who am I, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Well, suppose I go to Israelites and say to them, Hey, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What's his name? What am I supposed to tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're supposed to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is the name you shall call me from generation to generation. People of God, this is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. So if you put yourself in this text right now, it's kind of an odd question again. Why would God's people ask this question? Well, surely God's people had heard stories of God's faithfulness. They had heard about Abraham. They probably would have heard stories about Isaac and Jacob, right? You have the whole book of Genesis preceding the events of what we just read. Now, they had heard stories about God's faithfulness, but if you put yourself in the shoes of God's people, what's happening to them right now? They're enslaved. They've been losing for 400 years. And so when Moses shows up, the guy who just murdered somebody, and has been AWOL for 40 years, he shows up and is like, guys, I'm back. I'm here to save the day. God sent me. They're like, one, where have you been? And two, who is this God that you're coming to represent? Because it doesn't look like things are going really well for us right now. So when they say, what's the name of the God who sent you? What they're really asking is what's this God capable of? What can he do for us? What can he do when we're getting beaten by Pharaoh, we're making brick after brick, building towers, building sphinxes, building pyramids, all these things? Like, what what is this? Because right now it's not going well. What can this God do for you? How powerful is he? Because again, the Hebrew word for the name is Shem, and that gets behind your reputation. It gets behind your deeds. It gets behind how good you are. So if you've ever gone out and your mother or your father said, behave, our good name's at stake, that's it. Or if you're going out on a business call representing your company, like, hey, do a good job and perform to the best of your abilities because the name of the company is at stake. You get what I'm saying right here? It's your reputation that comes behind the name. They want to know, what can you do for me? What can this God do? And now, again, unlike God, Moses has been changing. He's been developing like baby Clark to who I am today. Uh, We're growing and developing. The late pastor Tim Keller had this great quote. He said, my wife has been married to five different men, and they have all been me. I was like, that is profound. He said, because I have grown, I have changed. By God's grace, I've been sanctified, and I'm on a trajectory of becoming more like Jesus. But when God says, I am who I am, what he's saying to Moses is, I am unchanging. Who I have always been is who I am today. And who I am today is who I'm always going to be in the future. Trust me. Trust me, Moses. Trust me that the God who created the universe has got your back, and I am faithful. When you look at the I am, this is the name God took upon himself, who I am, there's repeated verbs in the Hebrew, and the repeated verbs are in the present tense and the future tense. It could be translated something like this if I were going to do it on my own. God's saying, I am right now what I will be forever. Again, he's unchanging. God's not graduating. God's not leveling up. God's not promoting. He's the same. Think about how helpful that would be if you knew what to expect. Every day of the weather, you knew what it was going to be. Or if your health was unchanging. Or if the market was unchanging. Like, life would be so much easier. And think about your relationships. You know, we've all been betrayed. You've had somebody say something behind your back you wish they hadn't said. Imagine if everybody was unchanging, was ethical, was moral, and had high character all the time. Can you imagine how good life would be? And this is who God is. He is unchanging. He is holy. He is unlike anyone else or anything else ever created. Now, when this interaction with God and Moses, look at verse 15. God said to Moses, Right, now say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So not only is there a present faithfulness and a future faithfulness in the name, I am who I am. He's saying, and just remember, I've always been faithful. Look at Abraham's life. Was I faithful to him? Look at, look at Isaac's life. Look at Jacob's life. Now Israel. Has I been faithful? Joseph, have I been faithful? God has always been faithful. And so there's a time you and I, you're in the season where you're like, my world's upside down. I'm not sure what to expect. 
one hour from now, let alone five minutes from now, you have got to look back on God's past faithfulness because that will get you through the present moment and help you get into the next five minutes into your tomorrows. God is faithful. And so at Emmanuel, we have that line, that rowboat vision, where you look back at God's faithfulness as you back your way into the future. Because God is a faithful God. He has provided for this church. He has provided for your family. He has provided for his church throughout history. And he's provided for you. I got this saying called a forgetter that kicks in often. And so quickly, I go, oh, woe is me. My life is terrible. This is the worst day ever. And how quickly I just got to look back and go, oh, but yesterday I was praising God because it was awesome and my prayers were answered and everything I wanted to happen, happened. It's like, Clark, come on. Look at who's unchanging. My emotions, up and down. My feelings, up and down. But God, past, present, future, faithful. And he's revealing himself to us through his word. He's revealing himself to us through his faithfulness. Now, something funny is happening in our house right now. Our kids have discovered these boxes that are underneath our bed. And so they're going through all of our stuff. And they're like going through Bobby Jean's uh, college box. Like, Mom, who are all these young ladies in these red uniforms? And Bobby's like, that's me and my volleyball team. They're like, you played volleyball before I was born? Like, yes, we've talked about this. Like, who is this right here? Well, that was, that was my best friend. And like, you had friends before I was born? It's like, they're perplexed that we had a life before they existed, right? And the thing is, we're not hiding this from them. They're just discovering it for themselves as we live life. God's not hiding himself from you. He is progressively revealing more and more of himself to you as you lean and you seek him out. This is a beautiful gift, but, but as he does this, he's saying, I want you to participate in what I am, who I am is doing. So look what Moses responds to Moses. I love this. This is a huge takeaway for us today. Moses is psyching himself out. He looks back at God and says, well, God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you. God is essentially saying, Stop focusing on who you are and pay more attention to who I am. Because sometimes it's like, I got to share my faith. Well, I'm nervous. It's uncomfortable. Clark, stop focusing on yourself and focus on I am who I am. Can I, can I pray for that person? It might be odd, but I think I can do it. Clark, stop focusing on who you are and focus on who I am is. Is that you tracking with me? Stop paying attention to who I am and how I feel and pay more attention to who the unchanging, past, present, faithful God is. The great I am who I am. And he wants you to join in what he's doing. Amen. It's exciting stuff. It's so exciting, this adventure. So I am has been faithful in the past. I am has been faithful in the present. I am has been faithful and will be faithful in the future. Now, come back to the biblical story. What happens is as God's revealing himself to his people, there are seasons where God's people do really well, and it's when they're obedient, like the golden years of Israel. But then what they do is they, they end up giving their hearts to the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Hittites and all these other pagan deities, and they're giving themselves away to other gods and goddesses. And then there's cycles of sin and there's cycles of judgment. So prophets come in, and the prophets can't save the people. And the priests come in in the Old Testament and they can't save the people. And the law is given and the law really can't save the people. And there are kings. There's a few good kings, but there's a lot of bad kings. And the kings can't save God's people. And then there's this, this intertestamental period of silence where it's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where it's quiet. And God's people are going... Where is God? And that's when the gospels begin. That's when Jesus comes on the scene. So we have the God revealing himself as I am who I am. Now there's this, this quiet period and Jesus comes on. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, grew up in Nazareth, learned carpentry, and at the age of 30 began his ministry. And what happens now in the gospels, if you've never read them, Jesus begins teaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus begins pointing to the Father. 
He begins teaching about how we're to relate to God and love God and be loved by God and how we're supposed to love everybody else. He turns like the ways of the world upside down on their head and starts taking in the people that nobody likes and nobody loves, the, the foreigner and the orphans and the widows and all these people. He says, you can belong, just repent and believe and follow me. And Jesus' following starts growing and it's growing and it's growing. And pretty soon there's thousands of people that are following this guy named Jesus. And so what's happening is all the religious leaders, the Romans are going, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is this guy? What's happening? And what happens is attention continues to build and build and build. And if you go to John 8 with me now, John 8, there's all kinds of disputes in this chapter because the tension's coming to a head and people want to know who is Jesus? That's the title of our sermon series. Who gave you the authority to teach? Who gave you the authority to heal all these people? Where did you come from? Who is your rabbi? Who are your parents? They're all trying to figure out who is Jesus. And Jesus starts making some really bold claims. Look at verse 31. To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you will be my disciples. So Jesus is saying, if you follow me and you believe in me, you're going to be my disciples and you're going to know what real love is. You're going to know what it means to live a life of forgiveness. You're going to know what humility looks like. You're going to know what thriving in a flourishing life can, can be felt and experienced as. But you got to follow Jesus. And so Jesus is basically about to draw a line in the sand and say, now let me lay down some absolute truth claims for you as well. Now when it comes to truth in our cultural moment, People claim that there is like no truth. This is the thing right now. Truth is relative. Meaning you have your truth, I have my truth. And you do you and I'll do me. But, but the reality is that works for about two minutes until we disagree. And then we start slandering each other on Twitter. And we start gossiping, calling each other names. So really the whole my truth thing, that's out the window. And the idea that there's no absolute truth in this world is really nonsense. And I'm not saying this lightheartedly, but in a day and age where people are identifying in so many different ways, one, I think it's a trend. Two, I think there's mental illness. Three, I think it's demonic. But if someone identifies as a bird and they jump off a building, there's an absolute truth called gravity that is going to be experienced really quickly. And it's going to hurt. Or if someone identifies as a fish and they jump in the water and think, I'm going to swim really deep and just breathe underwater forever. That's going to be like a 30-second swim. And then you're going to realize there's an absolute truth called a lack of oxygen underwater. You know, there's other absolute truths like Chick-fil-A is better than Raising Cane's and the Dodgers are better than the Giants. Like there's, there's all kinds of absolute truths out there we could talk about all day, right? All kinds of absolute truths. But if you keep going the passage, look at what Jesus says next. So Jesus says, if you follow me, you're going to be my disciples. And then Jesus says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But what's happening here is the Jewish people thought because they were good boys and girls in Sunday school and they followed all the rules and they were on their best behavior, that made them worthy of being children of God because they were on their best behavior. I followed all the rules. I got A's in, in Jewish school. So therefore, I'm better than you and I get to go be with, be with the Lord in heaven. And what's happening here is Jesus is making these claims like, you're actually in bondage. Let me teach you about what true life is and let me show you what's really true and let me show you what freedom looks like. Because the reality is the Bible teaches us that you and I can be on our best behavior, we can smile and still harbor sin, hatred, lust, anger, envy in my heart. Why I'm smiling at you. And while my kids make their bed. And while the list could go on and on. So Jesus is saying, I'm here to do something for you that the world cannot do. I'm here to do something for you that the world cannot do. And pretty soon, the tension just keeps building because Jesus' following is growing. And the religious leaders are like, who is this guy? How can he make these claims? What's this all about? And if there was ever a time in the Bible where yo mama jokes were coming in, it would be John 8. They start talking about who their parents are. They're like, yo, your daddy's the devil, is what they're saying in John 8. You can read it for yourself. You're a child of Satan. And Jesus and the religious leaders are going back and forth about where they come from. And they're like, we're the true children of Abraham. And Jesus is like, no, just because you followed the rules does not make you a child of God. 
and the tension's building up, and look at what Jesus responds. Here's a climax of the story. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. This is huge. Look at what happens. Look at the the response Jesus gets when he says, I am. They picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself away, slipping away from the temple ground. Why would they pick up stones to stone Jesus? Because Jesus just said, remember God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush? That was me. Remember the God who said, I am past faithful and I created? Jesus is like, yeah, that was me. And the God who walked with Abraham? That was me. And the God who was with Isaac and Jacob? That was me. The God who went before uh, his people out of Egypt as a cloud of smoke and the pillar of fire? That was me. Jesus is saying, I am God. And now a line has been drawn and the religious leader's like, we gotta kill this guy. And Jesus is like, I am who I am. And so now as you fast forward time, people have tried to make claims about Jesus. Like, he's a really good teacher. Yeah, he's a prophet. You know, he really lived in Nazareth. Yep, he really died. That's recorded in Roman history. And there seems to be this crazy revival after he supposedly resurrected, but I don't know, right? Jesus is saying, I am God. He's not saying he's a moral teacher. Jesus is not saying, I am just a prophet. Jesus is not just saying, yeah, I really lived in Nazareth. Jesus is saying himself, right from the horse's mouth, I am God. So what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Because some of us come from generations of faith, and without realizing it, we think that mom's faith and dad's faith, or grandpa and grandma's faith, has become a badge that we somehow automatically get clearance to this relationship with God, that's not how it works. You have to have a relationship with the great I am if you want to experience salvation and eternal life. And there are some of us here who are newer to Christianity, and I'm so glad you're here. I love that you're here. Maybe you're a first generation checking this out. You have to wrestle with yourself and your own heart, your own questions. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? And just have in mind what Jesus said about himself. He said, I am God. He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am not the God of the dead. He says, I am the God of the living. And whoever follows me will have a flourishing life and will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus said, I am God. But it gets better. So the next seven weeks or so, we're going to unpack these statements where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection, I am the gate, I am the shepherd, I am the way, truth, and life, all these things, I'm the vine and the branches. But there's another I am that doesn't get talked about as often that I want to fast forward and look at with you because it's going to set up our time for communion today. So as Jesus' ministry continues to grow and grow and grow, Jesus is making these claims. And after he claims to be the resurrection and the life, and he brings his friend Lazarus back from the dead, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Eventually, the religious leaders are like, we are going to murder this guy ASAP. We have to get him out of here because he has problems. He has trouble. And so this is what happens. Jesus goes and he has the Last Supper. He is washing his disciples' feet. He's teaching them what his kingdom is all about. And they go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And while they're there, a detachment of soldiers shows up with Judas, who betrayed Jesus, to arrest Jesus, and they're going to kill him. So when they're in the garden, this detachment of soldiers, I'm going to get to that in just a minute, shows up. This is what the scripture says in John 18. Pay really careful attention. Jesus walks up to him, and knowing all that was going to happen to him, he went out and he asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am, they drew back and they fell on the ground. I put this there in the italics because if you look in your English Bible, because of the English translation and trying to make sense of it logically, they put a pronoun in there where Jesus says, I am he, But when you look in the Greek, there is no pronoun. It is ego eimi. It is I am. Pointing again back to Exodus 3.15, the burning bush. 
And what's the response of the people who come into the presence of the man who says, I am God? They fall on their faces. Do you know how many people are in a detachment of soldiers? You look at any concordance, any commentary, look at Tim Keller, John Piper, anybody trustworthy's work. They said there is a minimum of 200 to 600 soldiers that showed up to arrest Jesus that night. These Roman soldiers are the most dangerous dudes on the planet at the time. They are bred and born to kill. They kill me with their pinky finger. And they walk up and they're about to arrest this peaceful healer who is teaching about the kingdom of God. And they say, we're here for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. Boom. And they all fall down. 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 people fall down. Why? Because when you come into the presence of God, it is almost traumatic. And you look at all throughout the Bible, when Ezekiel came for the presence of God, what did he do? He fell on his face. And Isaiah comes into the presence of God. What does he do? Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he falls on his face. And they're, they're coronating the temple in 2 Chronicles. And God's presence come in. And what happens to the multitude there? They fall on their face. And then Peter realizes who Jesus is. And he says, woe is me, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. He falls on his face. And then Saul is going to Damascus and then this bright light appears on the road. What happens to him? He falls off his ride on his face. Why? Because the grandeur and the glory of God is so powerful. And Jesus is saying, all of this, I am. I am creator. I am alpha. I am omega. I am healer. I am protector. Like we sang last week, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. Jesus says all these things. See, there is no wiggle room for you to say he is just a prophet or he is just a good man or he is just a teacher. Jesus is saying so clearly, I am God. That's what he's saying. Now this gets even better. John 18, verse 8. They all get off the ground. They're about to arrest Jesus. Jesus answered them and he told them. He said, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. In the Greek, let these men go. The Greek word is aphemi. Of the times it's used, 50 of the times it's used for forgiveness. So already what's happening in the Garden of Gethsemane is there's a transaction happening. Jesus is saying, take me so they can go free. Take the I am who I am so that they can live. Do you see what's happening right now? Jesus is saying, I will offer my body. I will turn myself in if you let them live. Just as we come to the communion table in just a minute, this is a perfect picture of what Jesus was getting at in the garden. Who are you? I am. They all fall down. They're getting back up. Jesus is like, I offer myself willingly. Let them go. Such a beautiful picture. And you're going to come just a few minutes and take the bread and the cup. Jesus' body was broken for you. He wasn't a victim. It wasn't an accident. This was God's plan before the creation of the world. God would limit himself and come to earth so that we could know him. For the sole purpose of God living a sinless life and going to the cross and dying for us so that all who would repent and believe in Jesus, God, our Lord and Savior, would have everlasting life. Isn't that something? And so Jesus is making all these claims and saying, I am God. And people, worship team, you can come back up. People often will thumb their nose at the claims of exclusivity. Like, oh, they're so exclusive, or they're so exclusive. Jesus is so exclusive. Everybody's exclusive. If you claim to be the most accepting and tolerant person west of the Mississippi, that's an exclusive claim. Because you're excluding everybody else who claims to have an idea. So when Jesus says, I am who I am, it is exclusive. But let me tell you, what political party has ever died for you? What Fortune 500 company has ever died for you? What other sports teams ever laid down their life and even knows your name? But the I am who I am did. He loves you. He says, I want a relationship with you. We repent and believe. Let me pray for us, and the worship team will continue leading. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this chance to sing scriptures and to pray and to lean in. We thank you, Lord, for the next two months as we lean into the I am's of Jesus, that you would reveal more of yourself to us. We thank you that you're not a God who hides, but you're a God who longs to be sought after. And I'm praying for every heart in this room and every ear and eye that's watching online. That we would lean in, we'd ask the hard questions, we'd wrestle with this, who is Jesus to us? And we'd hold on to the, these claims that you make, God, with Jesus, you're saying, I am God. Would we receive this truth? We pray for soft and fertile hearts that seed would land on good soil and take deep root. Would allow us to withstand the elements and the trials of this world because life is tough. Would you bless us now in this time of communion? Holy Spirit, would you minister to us through this beautiful sacrament? Remind us that you're God, that it's by grace through faith that we have been saved. And I pray for those here today who have been wrestling with this and maybe aren't yet a Christian, that maybe today's the day they'd accept you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. how he will be faithful because he is the great, the great I am. The mountain shake before you, the demons rub and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in
the great I am, no one like you, last time, the great I am. Come on, let's praise his name together. God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord. As we continue in our service, we get to give our tithes and our offerings to the great I am. You can be seated right now. Second Corinthians says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So if you have your offering, you can give as the basket passes your row or you can give online, give as you're led. that Jesus is God. He is the great I am. So church, will you join us in continuing to proclaim that truth with the words of the Nicene Creed. We love using creeds and confessions because they not only unite us to what we believe, but they unite us to the church worldwide. It's beautiful that on every Sunday, there might be other churches, other believers across the world sharing these same words. Amen? Amen. So together we say, We believe believe in in one one God, God, the Father Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made, For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Amen. So as we prepare for 
our time of communion. I love the way Pastor Clark began his sermon by reminding us that it is God himself who chooses to reveal who he is. And he not only does that as a, he doesn't do that as a distant God. It's like, here's who I am now, worship me. No, the great I am became meek and lowly. Not losing his power, but laying it aside so that we could be saved. So just as sure as you can touch your cup and I can touch the bread and taste the, the, the juice, the wine, our God is real. Amen? And again, not a distant, powerful creator, but somebody who is near, somebody who is close, somebody who chooses to extend an invitation. Again, from the beginning of the service, we are called to worship we proclaim his name, we confess our sins, we get to hear his word, we respond by saying the great I am and the giving of our, our material things, our, our tithes and our offerings. And now the climax of the service, the peak point, the invitation to come to the table, the reminder of God's love, the reminder of his salvation given to us. This is why we gather, this is why we're here to worship the great I am who freely invites us in. Man. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And together we say, Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ has risen, risen and Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We say, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. So church, would you please take, eat, and drink, and remember that the Lord, the great I am, loves you and chooses to save you. Would you please stand and join us as we continue singing to God. joined us for our service this morning. Will you please let us know you were here. You can fill out the friendship folder in the app, or you can text your name to text at erc.la. These next announcements are for all the ladies. Women's Walk begins next week, and we're going on a journey through the names of God. There are multiple days you can join in for the study. You have Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday night, or there are also online groups available um, if you prefer that. And if you would like to sign up for a group, you can go outside and see Jody and the team. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We have the women's retreat also coming up. It's around the corner now. So if you would, um, if you haven't, re if you have not registered yet for the retreat, go outside and register. I think you'll be blessed um, if you come. And lastly, 
you are more than welcome to come up after service to receive prayer from our prayer ministers. Amen. So one last quick announcement tomorrow for those of you who like playing basketball. Above the rim starts at 6.30. So please do your best to come here to the parking lot. Invite someone. Spread the word. It's a great ministry. And if you're willing to help out with check-in and other things, please talk to Andrew Hernandez. Not this one, but the one that's right up there on the cameras. He'll be more than happy to take any volunteers. All right? Would you place your hands like this so I can give you a blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, the powerful, helpful support of the Spirit be with you all. Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here be.